Hello, this is John, and today I'm reviewing the game Railway Empire by Gaming Minds and Calypso Media. This game is rated E for everyone, so parents, you don't have to worry about your kids playing this one. This game is available for between $50 and $60 on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. I am reviewing it on the Xbox One. As usual, in this review, I will cover some game mechanics and give you some tips that should improve your experience. Since this game focuses on historical events, there really are not a lot of spoilers to give away. The game includes a lot of steam power. The campaign and scenarios included take place prior to the advent of diesel power, so there are no diesel or electric locomotives, with the exception of the EMD E unit shown here. According to one source I found, this is because the developers intend to release free add-on material to supplement the game later. The game is set up so that if you play through the campaign mode, you will learn enough about the game mechanics to complete the campaigns and play through the scenarios as well. The most basic way to describe what the game is about is this. You have to figure out the best way to move people and commodities in order to supply towns so that they grow. In 1863, on the banks of the Missouri River, the last chapter in the monumental undertaking of the Transcontinental Railroad began. You build stations in towns to receive and send commodities. You also have to build supply towers and maintenance facilities strategically in your network so that your trains get the stuff they need to operate properly. The game is actually fairly complex, and there are a lot of caveats and intricacies to its finer points. I will cover as much as possible in as basic a way as I can so you get the picture. Commodities come in the form of raw materials and finished products. For example, wood can be transported from a rural station to a town where a sawmill turns it into cut lumber, which is then transported to another town where furniture is made. Then once the furniture is made, it is transported to another town where the citizens are demanding it. It can be a little confusing because towns create demand for raw materials even if they don't have the industries to process the raw materials into finished products. The demand for everything depends on the population of the town. This point is very important because a town will only grow if you supply it with what it needs by rail. You can see how much of what an industry produces is being shipped by rail in the window that opens when you select the industry. Ship as much by rail as you can, and the industry will become more productive. If you own the industry, you can expand it. If the computer owns it, it will expand automatically based on how much demand there is. You can see what is in demand in a town by opening up the town information window. Anything that is not grayed out can be shipped to and from that town to help it grow. As the needs of a town change, you have to adjust your train routes or add new ones to provide what is in demand. You can buy industries on the map as well as the businesses that process the raw materials in the towns. When a town reaches a certain population, you're given a limited amount of time to start a business there in order to process the raw materials it is receiving. If you don't start your own business, then a private entity, that would be the computer, starts whatever business it thinks is going to be profitable there. If you're short on funds, you can issue bonds to raise money in the short term, but you have to pay it back with interest. This can be very useful when purchasing businesses that will become profitable over time, or when starting a new business in the town like I just described. As time passes, you acquire innovation points that can be spent on operational improvements in this trains and locomotives tree, or business improvements in this company and construction tree to help your company become more efficient. You use these innovations to unlock newer, more powerful locomotives or decrease construction costs for tunnels and bridges or new routes. Every so often a newspaper headline will flash across your screen. These articles sometimes include information that can help you make decisions in the game, but in most cases they're just recollections of historical events that were going on in the times which you're simulating. You can also hire employees. Employees come in three types. Train personnel that can add bonuses to a train's efficiency, and 
office personnel that can make your operations cost less, or the third type of employee are one-time expenses that produce a specific effect, such as a bandit who is hired to steal from a competitor's company. Employees have personalities that sometimes conflict with each other and can cause trains to stop operation because the trained personnel are in conflict. Pay attention to these arrows when you're hiring someone or assigning them to a train. If they're red, choose someone else to man the train or just leave some positions empty. If you have red arrows, that indicates the possibility for conflict issues. I found the tutorials to be sufficient, but at times confusing or incomplete. It may be that I'm accustomed to very thorough instructions that really hold my hand throughout a game, so I'm not knocking this game's tutorial system necessarily. What I will say, however, is to really pay attention to what the tips tell you when they pop up on the screen. It could save you a lot of frustration later. I'll tell you the parts that I had some problems with, so that might help you avoid the frustration that I experienced. Of specific interest and use is the information on setting up signals. Unless you play on the easiest setting, you'll need to set up passing tracks with signals so that your trains can pass each other. And you'll also have to use signals to distinguish blocks on double-tracked parts of your routes. The tutorial on setting up a passing siding, what the game calls a side track, is very clear. What was not clear to me was setting up blocks. Here's an example of how I would set up a double-tracked section with blocks so that you can maximize the efficiency in a route between two towns. First, you connect your track to a station in a town and then run it to its destination. In this case, we're going from Elko to Winnemucca. Next, just outside of the town, set up a switch and create your parallel track right alongside the original track. Then you create another switch near the destination town, in this case Winnemucca, and rejoin the first track like this. The idea here is that one of these tracks will be for trains going one direction, and the other will be for trains going in the opposite direction. So you set up a signal here to let the trains leaving Elko know that they can't go on the track that has the opposing traffic. I set mine up to run on the right side, just like how we drive on the roads in the US where I live. This signal indicates the direction, and the red part is a do not enter image. Now trains departing from Elko know that they have to take the track to the right. To set up a block, you put in a direction only signal like this, and then make sure it's facing the right direction. That indicates the end of one block and the beginning of a new block. So if a train is occupying the next block, the train that's here will wait until it's clear. You can estimate how long your train is when fully loaded and place signals at intervals that are about the same length that run the distance of the track to the destination and the return trip as well. That way you can set up as many trains as will fit without causing a problem. So if you have space for three blocks, you can set up as many as six trains on the route. You won't have to do this until much later in the game, but setting up passing sightings will be very important early on, so pay attention in the first campaign when they show you how to do it. Setting up train routes also is more dynamic than I remember the tutorials explaining. You can tell the game to load specific things at stations or give priority to certain commodities. You can even set up routes that carry only freight or only express exclusively. The game has some pretty cool cutscenes that introduce and conclude the campaign modules and I found the campaign to be very enjoyable and quite addictive to play. During one of my sessions I stayed up all night by accident because I totally lost track of time while trying to accomplish the tasks provided in the module to claim the victory. I mean, that's how addictive this is. I got up to go to bed thinking it was around midnight and it was already 6.30 AM. There's also a stock market and you're sometimes presented with competition in the form of NPCs that build and operate other railroads on the same map. You can buy their stock and force mergers if you run things right. And now you have taken over a competitor. You beat me, and hereby I retreat. I want to address a complaint that I've seen on online forums and blogs. Many players are angry that the NPC competitors are not beholden to the same limitations as the player is. 
especially when it comes to constructing tracks. I have to say, I agree with the criticism, especially when I've managed to do a hostile takeover of a competitor and I find myself having to construct tons of extra passing tracks and upgrading to double track with blocks the way I described a minute ago. It seems to me that if I take over a competitor, the track infrastructure should be compliant with the same rules that I've been playing under. I suppose to avoid this problem, I could play on the easiest setting, but that doesn't require passing tracks or double tracking. It does seem a bit unfair, if not flat out strange, for the NPCs to be playing against me on the easiest setting while I'm struggling with making my signal infrastructure work properly because I chose to have a challenge in the game. And I don't know what the solution is, but I would imagine they'll probably address that if enough people are complaining about it. So in conclusion, I think the game is well worth the price if you like railroad simulators. You can easily get dozens of hours of play out of it just by going through the campaign modules. It reminds me a lot of Railroad Tycoon 3, which was my all-time favorite train game. It's so similar, in fact, that it could have easily been the sequel to Railroad Tycoon 3. One thing I would not recommend is taking the game's representation of historical events too seriously. The module about the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad implies that the Golden Spike was driven at Promontory Point, Utah, which is incorrect. The Golden Spike was actually driven in Promontory, Utah, which is about 30 miles away from Promontory Point. Promontory and Promontory Point are two very different places in Utah. I found a few discrepancies like this in the game, but it wasn't really enough to turn me completely off. The graphics are pretty good, but not stunning. The trains are fun to watch, and there's a ride-along mode that you can activate if you want an on-the-train experience. I found the controls and command structure to be very clunky on the Xbox One, frequently frustrating me when I accidentally demolished a very expensive rail line that I had just built, or a very expensive industry that I had just built in a town. Maybe the game just doesn't translate well to this platform, I would expect the PC version to be a lot better in this regard, simply because you have a full keyboard at your disposal and not just 15 to 20 buttons for navigation and control. I'm really disappointed that they didn't release this game for Mac. I think they would find it to be very much worth the effort to release it on Mac, and it would provide the people who play the game a really great platform for it. I had some trouble with one of my maps. Once it became very congested, the game would just crash if I backed the camera up far enough to include too much detail. A little surprising since Xbox One is pretty good at processing data. When you're playing with all the sounds turned on, and you have NPCs playing against you, there are very repetitive and annoying comments that come from the NPCs, annoying enough that it caused me to figure out how to turn them off. I found those things highly disruptive to the play experience, and they don't add anything of value to the game, in my opinion. The musical soundtrack is pretty good, but I turned it off after a while because I found it a bit too repetitive. With all that being said, I would still highly recommend this game to anyone who likes trains or train simulators. It is ridiculously addictive, and it presents enough challenges to keep you interested for a long time. I'll be watching out for the add-on, downloadable content, and possible sequels. The door's wide open for it. If you find my content interesting, entertaining, or worthwhile in other ways, please subscribe and leave a comment. Did you play the game? Did you like the game? What did you think? Let us know. Thanks for watching and make it a great day.